<laughs> good morning. I just listened to my introduction thinking, boy, he sounds pretty good. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Colin. How many people know Pastor Colin is a wonderful man? Yeah. I've only ever known two Collins in my life. And uh, both of them have been really nice men. And uh, you're a good man, Pastor Colin. He's a good, good man. I think we should pray while we're all standing. What do you think? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you that God, after such a long season, we can, Lord, rejoice because they said unto us, come on, let's go into the house of God. And Father, here we are in the house of God together. Wherever we gather, you are with us. And so whether we're in the room or whether we're at home, online, or wherever we are right now, Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that, God, you are for us and not against us. We thank you, Father, that, God, it is you that have caused us to be born again. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom, there is joy. Because you are all of those things. So I pray right now, God, that by your Holy Spirit, you would capture us again. God, as we lean into your word, lean in. Have I just gone off the air? Oh, come back on the air. God, as we just lean in, that Lord, your presence, your presence, Father, would lift faith within us because that's your promise, God. Woo! <laughs> faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray that all our electronic demons disappear. Are we swapping to that? We're just going to wait a little moment. Let's see how we go. It's probably me. It's probably me. Are you all good? Yeah. So good to be back in the room. And uh, I think before, you know, we're, we're very, 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 very quick to move on in things, aren't we? And uh, I don't know, I'm sure you've been doing this, but I, I want us just to give a shout out. Um, just to Pastor John, Pastor Lois, uh, Jason, Melissa, all of the team, uh, your leadership here at Encompass Church, uh, that while all of our lives have been thrown into disruption as far as our worship Sundays go, uh, that doesn't mean we haven't been, not the church, but while all of our normal Sunday routines have been thrown into absolute confusion, your leadership team, your covering, uh, have been continuing just to do their very, very best um, and not just give their best of 100%, but 110%. And I want to tell you, I know from a leadership perspective, this last season uh, has been one of the most demanding seasons the church has ever known globally. Um, but your leadership has been there rock solid all the way. And so I don't know about you, but I think you should put your hands together and just thank God for Pastor John and all of the team for just leading you through this time and continuing to. And hey, it's not just the leadership, it's your worship team, uh, it's all of the technical team. There's been such a, a growth curve to be able to make sure that the word gets out, that connection can still happen, even though our doors may have been closed on the Sundays. And uh, so I know as a church, that's, my, that, that's gotta be your heart, but I wanna encourage you. Um, you know, while you're just rubbing shoulders again and while you're meeting up again with those that have been serving so diligently throughout this season. Make sure you look them in the eye. Make sure that you give them a hug, do whatever, um, and let them know how much you appreciate what they've been doing so that you and I as the body can keep strong and healthy during that season. Is, this, is that a deal? Because I'm telling you, one word of encouragement goes a long way in this season. And uh, this season is full of all kind of crazy atmospheres and crazy words, but we get to set the atmosphere of heaven. In the midst of turmoil, in the midst of confusion, we get to set the atmosphere of heaven. So don't be passive in this season. Make sure that you're stepping up to every opportunity to encourage, embrace those people around about you because uh, that's the heart of God in a season like this. I better get into the Word because we're on a time frame this morning. Or can we just forget the clock? <laughs> that was a really mediocre, yeah, go for it, Pastor. It was sort of like, no, we've got to get out of here. All right, if you're taking notes, I want to speak to you this morning about praise 
purpose and prison. Prison, praise and purpose. Or if you need a a second heading, I would like to call this one, um, you know, learning to praise in dark places. We often talk about praise in high places, but how many people know that it's our praise in dark places that carries more power than any other kind of praise? And the reality is that many of us have been in a time and have been in a season where we've been challenged in so many different ways. I wonder if you can remember what you were doing on Wednesday, September 22, 9 a.m. That date may mean nothing to you at the moment, but let me remind you what happened. On that day at that time, my wife and I were sitting in our front room, um, just having a wonderful time of just sitting around the Word and praying together. And then all of a sudden, now you'll start to remember, all of a sudden, Wednesday 22, 9 a.m., Melbourne experienced the earthquake. And in our house, everything started to move. Now, we live in a very solid house. Like, it's rock solid. It's got a basement. It's got solid, like, it's a honky house. But I'm telling you, it started to shake. And I can remember sitting there, and here's what happened. All across Melbourne and into uh, some of the regional areas of Victoria, everybody started to have the same reaction. What's happening? And in that moment of time when the earth was being shaken across Melbourne, we started to ask that question, what is happening? What's going on? What do I do now? And I think that moment is a a picture of our last 18 months or two years. I think that's the picture that many of us ask as we've gone through this pandemic and continue to go through the aftershocks of this pandemic, that we've asked ourselves, God, what is going on? Because that time threatens two of the things that are most, most valuable to you and I, and that is our comfort and our sense of control. You see, as humans, that's what we, we want to feel comfortable. And as humans, we want to feel we've got some kind of sense of control. But when you're in an earthquake or when we've gone through the pandemic, those two areas of our lives have been put under so much pressure. And for normal people, they've asked all sorts of questions about, well, you know, will, what, when will things get back to normal? Will, will I be able to survive this economically, relationally, spiritually? And as the church and as believers... We've also asked the question many times, I know I have, saying, God, what is going on? How am I supposed to respond in this season when so much is out of my control and there are so many things that I'm not in charge of anymore? So many dreams that I was pursuing that now I can't pursue anymore. And we ask that question, what on earth is going on? God, what are you doing? Now this morning, I've got to tell you, I don't have the answers to COVID. (laughs) Isn't it amazing how many theories there are about COVID? I don't have the answers. I don't have opinions on COVID, but I, I want to bring a word this morning that I believe is applicable to every single one of us as far as how do we respond in uncertain times? What is God looking for from us when the world is being shaken and when everything we thought was going to happen necessarily isn't happening. What does God look for in our lives then? What is the trigger that is going to release blessing and grace in our lives when everything else is seemingly out of control? But before I do that, I've got to lay a foundation. I've got to, I've got to just speak a principle, remind us of one of the most important principles of our gospel and of our lives. And this is as important as the foundation we build for our house. It's as important as whether we've got fuel in the car. It's as important as whether we turn the power on before we try to get our computer. If we don't get this one thing right, if we don't learn to stand on this one single truth, nothing else will ultimately make sense in our world and in our faith. And that is this, that no matter what is going on, No matter what is being shaken, no matter what pain we may be experiencing, no matter what frustration we might be seeing or what injustice we might be feeling or seeing in the world around about us, there is one thing we must lock onto and never walk away from and that is this, that our God is good. That our God is good and our God always has a purpose. 
Chronicles 16 verse 34 says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His love endures forever. Psalm 34 verse 8, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. Naaman 1 verse 7, The Lord is good. Good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Psalm 119, verse 68, speaking of God, you are good. Listen, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. I love that one. He says, you are good and you do good. It's in the very nature, it's in the very character, it's who God is. He, is. he is a good God and He does good. And here's the thing, He always has and He always will be doing good. James 1 verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, listen, who does not change like a shifting shadow. Can I tell you, pandemics can come and go. All kinds of circumstances and pressures and difficulties can come and go, but God does not change. God is good and God does good. Can you say amen? amen. That's our foundation. That's why we get saved. We can't get saved unless we actually have a revelation that says, no, God must be good. <laughs> Who would want to give their lives to a bad God? Yeah. It's the foundation of everything to understand that God is good. And God is so good, our minds can't even completely comprehend it. Great theologian A.W. Tozer said, the goodness of God is infinitely more wonderful than we will ever be able to comprehend. He's a good God. <laughs> Do you know what would change your life? If every morning you got up and you just made a declaration, God, I thank you that you are good and you do good every day. No matter what's going on, it would change our lives. But he's not only a good God, he is a purposeful God. God. He is good and He does good according to His plan and His purpose. Think about creation. Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. Can I remind you today, creation was not random. It wasn't just one big Bang, and then everything evolved. It was God working to a process of creation. He said, let there be light, and then began a process. He said, let the sky be separated from the sea, and on and on and on. He worked to a process, and it's the same in our lives. He has a plan for his church. He has a plan for the world. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life, and the good news is it's a good plan. Because he's a good God. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. He's not making them up as he goes. <laughs> he's not caught by surprise. He says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. There he's talking about the nation of Israel. But listen, Philippians 1 verse 6, Paul says, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you. Everyone say, in you. In you. Say now, in me. God who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, God is not phased by the pandemic. God is not phased by the economic upturn or downturn. God is not phased by whatever's happening around about us. He's got a plan. He's working for it. And he will complete the thing that he has in his mind for your life and my life. It's not like you or I trying to work on a flat pack from Ikea. You get halfway through that thing and what do you want to do? You want to smash that thing. You want to rip up the instruction. You want to think, this doesn't make sense and walk away. Can I tell you, no matter how much of a mess we make of our lives, no matter how much turmoil is going on, God never gets to the point where he just says, oh, forget it. It's too hard. I'm over it. You're on your own. No, God looks at us and he says, boy, you do some crazy things sometimes. And boy, you let your faith get pretty low sometimes. 
sometimes. And boy, you get yourself into real situations. But God is never phased. We get phased. We get discouraged. But God just looks and smiles and says, "Ah, it's okay. I will still bring to completion the plans I have for your life. How many people know that's good news? He says, I'm more committed to my plan in your life than you are. He's a good, good God. But here's the thing we've got to understand about God's plans. God's plans are often so different than what we think they're going to be. Think about it. God works to his time frame, not our time frame. We are often in such a hurry. We've got it all figured out. It's going to happen by this time or that time. But God says, no, no, no. I've got a plan and I'm going to work to my time. And the most foolish thing we can do is to try and force God to work in our time frame. How many people know God's never ever in a hurry? You know, do you remember the days when you could just jump on a plane and go somewhere? like international fly to another country? I can. Well, every time you did that, the first lesson I learned was that that you go to a different time zone and it takes a while for your body to catch up. Now, how foolish would it be if if you fly to somewhere and there's an eight-hour time difference or a four-hour, you wake up at, my tendency, I tend to wake up at about 4 a.m., well, how foolish would it be if I got up at 4 a.m., did all my stuff, went down for breakfast, and then the breakfast's not there, and I start yelling at all the, all the staff who are still in bed, saying, hey, it's breakfast time. Why aren't you here? Or I go out into the street and say, hey, where is everybody? Come on, it's time to rock and roll. How foolish would that be? I'm in their time zone. I'm not in my time zone. And yet how often do we sometimes yell at God? How often do we sometimes complain to God saying, hey, come on, God, rock rock and roll. God says, no, 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 no. You're in the wrong time zone. I've got a plan. We have to understand that if it's taking longer than what we think, there's always a reason. There sometimes might be us. Do you think it's possible that sometimes it doesn't happen even when God wanted it to happen because maybe we haven't been playing our part? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's the fact that God is still working things out in us. We're not ready yet. Yeah. And if God was to give us everything that he's promised before we are ready, we would never be able to handle it. Yes. He wants to bless, but how many know with blessing comes great responsibility? The greater the blessing, the greater the maturity. And that's why so often it takes longer because God's working on our maturity. He's not gonna give a 15-year-old a V8 and go out there and say, go for it. No, he's gonna wait until that 15-year-old grows up, gets a bit of maturity, a bit of experience and can learn, yes, you've got a big honky of a V8 sitting under that hot bonnet, but now you have to learn how to drive that with responsibility. It's the same with the blessing of God, the promises of God. God sometimes delays so that we can mature and be ready for the blessing. So come on, don't scream at him. Don't walk away in disappointment. Just say, God, I trust you. It's still coming. It's still coming. I've got to say to you this morning, there's somebody here needs to hear that word. It's still coming. Don't you give up. Don't you walk away. Don't you get down on yourself. Just keep your eyes on God. Do whatever he's told you to do in this season because the promise is still coming. It's still on its way. God's time frame is different from our time frame. Sometimes God's plans don't make sense to us. We are so linear. We are so natural. We get a promise from God and it's there. So what do we decide? Okay, if the promise is there, man, I'm up for it. (laughs) But what does God do? He says, yeah, there's your promise. But what does he do? He sends us over here. And then sometimes he sends us back up here. Sometimes it's, it's almost like we're thinking, God, why are we over here when the promise is there? And it doesn't seem to make sense. And sometimes we find ourselves in situations where it seems so far away from the presence of God because his plans just aren't what makes sense in our mind. Sometimes we feel completely hidden. We, we're hidden. We, we've got a promise from God that I'm going to do great things with you. I'm going to give you great influence. You're going to have great family. You're going to have a great job, great career. You're going to have a great ministry. You're going to preach to the multitudes. Amen. Hallelujah. But... You're hidden. Has anyone been hidden? Am I talking to anyone this morning? 
Have you felt hidden when the plans of God don't make sense? But the good thing again is if you feel hidden, if you feel you've gone on a sidetrack, it's always for a purpose. Yes. Always for a purpose. God is good. Yeah. And God always does good. But here's the other thing about the plans of God, and that is this, that sometimes in the very plan of God, God will allow us to experience pain and frustration and persecution that seems so unfair and that seem at times will absolutely crush us. And that's where I want us to go this morning in the last time that we've got this morning. This will be a really quick service, so you've got to listen really quickly. I want to speak to you this morning about Paul and Silas. Many of you will know this story, Paul and Silas, while they're in the prison, but I wonder if you've stopped to think about the, 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 the prelude to this story. It's really fascinating. You see, Paul and Silas with Timothy are on a missionary journey. They're setting off, and they're going, we're going to go and encourage the churches. We want to really strengthen the churches. So they're on a mission from God. They've gone under covering. They haven't just gone off on their own. They're doing the will of God under the covering of the church leadership, but nothing really seems to be going to plan. If you read before the early scriptures in, in Acts chapter 16, it says that they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. And then in verse 9, it says that he had this vision of a man in Macedonia. And so he goes to Macedonia, but he doesn't meet a man. He meets a woman, Lydia, down by the river. And then Lydia gets saved and it's all going well. The family are getting saved and he's preaching. And then this, this woman comes alongside them as they're ministering and starts yelling wherever they go, proclaiming, hey, these men are servants of God and they're proclaiming you the way of salvation. Sounds good, yeah? Your own cheerleader, your own PR person everywhere you go. But then they discern, no, no, she's got a spirit. That's actually a demonic spirit that's operating in her. So they cast the spirit out. That upsets the bosses of the one who'd been screaming and hollering. And so they get upset and Paul and Silas end up in prison, in stocks, chained, wondering what's gonna happen to them. How many people know when I read that, I get a bit confused? When I read that, I think, wait a minute, God, he's the best of the best of the best. He's Paul, he's the man, he's the apostle, he's the missionary, and he, it's not working out for him. He doesn't know what he's doing. He tries to go here, God says, no, go over there. He gives him, it's all wrong, and I get confused when I read that. I think, and he ends up in prison. I'm thinking, God, if nothing else, that's just sheer bad advertising. I mean, how does that look? Follow Jesus, serve God, and end up in prison. Who wants to give their life to Christ? <laughs> Bad advertising. I look at it, I'm confused by that. But then I don't know about you, I'm encouraged by that. Because I realize, hey, if Paul didn't have it all together, if Paul didn't know what it was to have a 10-step you know, perfect plan for the will of God in his life, and if it didn't always go well for him, if he ended up in persecution, if he ended up in pain, maybe, maybe, maybe we have to learn a few things from that. Maybe we have to start to understand there maybe isn't any perfect 10 point stand. Maybe there isn't a perfect plan. Maybe God just wants us to trust him. Maybe God just wants us, no matter what's going on around us, to stand on a revelation that God is good. And sometimes in our worst days, God is working his best plan. His best plans are often wrapped up in our worst days. It's not fair, but that's often how it's working out. So let's read the passage of Scripture. Acts chapter 16 from verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake, the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword, was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe God, he and his whole household. 
You know, I reckon before the earthquake, Paul would have been thinking to himself, this is crazy. I think before the earthquake, it would have been so tempting to just be there in the stocks thinking, God, is this what you wanted? Was this the plan? I'm sure he could have even been frustrated thinking, God, this is not what was supposed to be going on. I'm supposed to be planting churches. I'm supposed to be strengthening the churches. I'm supposed to be gathering the leaders. God, I'm supposed to be making a difference. And here I am in prison with chains. God, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Man, I felt that this last 18 months. <laughs> and I know most of you have felt that this last 18 months. God, it wasn't supposed to be like this. I was supposed to be living my best life. My family was supposed to be in a good place. My kids happy at school. My business thriving. God, it wasn't supposed to be like this. We ask that question and say, God, what are you doing? And again, we have to come back to the revelation that if God is good and he's always working good, then there's got to be a higher purpose for this season. There's got to be a higher purpose for me right now. It's not how I thought it would be, but that doesn't mean it's not how it was supposed to be because it's in prison that we can learn a few powerful points. Number one is this. It's in prison we can learn how to really exercise our praise. You see, I mean, I've got to tell you, when I came in this morning and we're worshiping again and the body's together again, and I'm so sorry if you're still online, whatever you can do, make sure when you're safe to be able to come into church, come into church. But I've got to tell you, I'm addicted to praise, I'm addicted to the body coming together and God visiting the atmosphere, changing and shifting the atmosphere. But I've got to tell you, sometimes our Sunday praise is easy praise. And I don't mean that in a harsh way. I don't mean that in a judgmental way. But sometimes it's easy to praise God when the, when the band's playing and when everyone is around about us and we're being built up and encouraged. That's easy praise. But can I tell you that your most powerful praise is when you are praising in your pain. Your pain elevates the power of your praise because when you can praise Him in your pain, you understand that God is above circumstance. God is above all of those things that we tend to let dominate us. When you praise him in your pain, things happen. That's exactly what Paul and Silas did. They realized we're gonna praise him. Job is another example of somebody who knew how to praise God in pain. If you know the story of Job, I can't go into it, but he was a good man, a righteous man. The devil came to God and said, ah, he's only good and righteous, only honors you because you bless him. Hey, you know, the interesting thing about that is that the devil actually had to ask God's permission before he could lay a hand on Job. The scary part is God said, yep, okay. <laughs> but that's actually good because it tells me that God already knew the answer. The only reason God said okay was because he knew that Job was not gonna buckle under that pressure. The devil has to ask God's permission before he is allowed to do anything in your life. Every test that comes your way, every test that comes my way has been pressure tested by God Himself. Nothing will come that you cannot handle in Him. Not in you, not in my strength, not in your strength. But there's nothing that God, won't, that God will allow in our lives that He knows if we say, God help me, that He will be able to bring us through. It's been pressure tested. The devil took everything away from Job. But you know what happened when Job woke up the next morning, he got all that news. It says, Job 120 got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I come from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. For the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Listen to this. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job didn't get mad. Job didn't roll over into a fetal position and give up. It's as if Job was saying, hey, I am in pain. Hey, I am confused. Hey, I didn't think it was supposed to be like this. I don't have any answers. This isn't a good thing. But it's like Job was saying, but this one thing I do know, God is good. 
and I will praise him. Whether he gives or whether he takes away, I will praise God. Can I tell you, that's the spirit God is wanting to put in the church. That's the spirit God is wanting to rise up in your life and in my life when we're in those prison situations that we just say, hey, I am going to praise him because I'm not waiting for a feeling. I'm standing on a revelation. How many people know when Paul and Silas were in the jail? It wasn't like a, a warm, fuzzy anointing came into the prison. Imagine that. If that was how the text went, there they were. Then all of a sudden, the angels. <laughs> Paul turned to Silas. Oh, did you feel that, Silas? Oh, it's an angel in the room. Oh, oh, did you feel that? Oh, that's the joy of the Lord bubbling up in me. Oh, Silas. Oh, Paul. Oh, Silas. Oh, Paul. It wasn't a warm, fuzzy anointing that came into the prison. It was a decision that Paul and Silas made on a revelation that they made a decision to say, I will praise my God no matter what's going on. They didn't know what was going to happen in the morning. They didn't know what God had in store. They didn't know anything, but they knew that God was good and he was worthy of their praise. Can I encourage you this morning, don't forget the power of your praise when you are in pain. Can I encourage you this morning, do not go silent in your prison. It's in your prison that God looks for your confession of faith. When you start to praise God, when you and I start to lift up our voices, and you might say, oh, that's not me. Oh, I'm not like that. Oh, I'm not that personality type. Oh, I'm tone deaf. God doesn't want to hear my praise. No, no, no. We've got to understand. It's a spiritual engagement. It's not an emotional thing. It's a spiritual engagement. And can I encourage you? Make one decision this morning. If nothing else, make one decision. Learn to live your life preloaded. And what I mean by that is, you fill your heart with so much scripture. You fill your heart with so much of the revelation of truth that when pressure comes, it's not a hard thing to choose because the Spirit of God will cause the Word of God to rise up within you. You see, I don't think that Job had to stir himself up. I think Job's revelation of the goodness of God was just there, just waiting. And when pressure came, when pressure came, the Word of God within started to bubble up within. And then all he had to do was get in line with the Word of God. Can I encourage you this morning, no matter what situation you are going through right now, no matter what situation you may go through in the future, align your mind align your mouth with the revelation of God's word that is in you, but don't wait for the pressure. Live preloaded so the word is already within your spirit. The truth of God that overrides every other circumstance is what is gonna be your strength in Jesus' name. I want you to stand to your feet if you will. I wanna invite the band to come. I think we've got time to sing one more song I'd love to sing the song we were singing early on, Champion, because there's, so there's so much truth in that one word, in that one song that we've been sharing about this morning. And I know I've, I've preached quickly this morning, but I happen to know that there's a God who knows exactly where you're at this morning. I know that there's a God this morning that, that loves you so much that everything that's happened in this service this morning hasn't been by chance, but it's been because He loves you. <laughs> because he's leaning over your life this morning. He's leaning over every circumstance. He sees it all. He knows it all. And what he's waiting for is not for you to be able to change things, not for you to be able to rearrange things, not for you to be able to sort things out, but for you and I this morning just to say, God, I trust you. God, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna lift up my voice in praise to you this morning. I may be in chains, I may be in a prison, I may be screaming this morning saying, God, it wasn't supposed to be like this. But even though it is like this, I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to worship you. So I'm going to pray for you in a moment, but before we pray, I'm going to ask the worship team just to lead us in this song. And I want these words to be a confession of your faith. 
no matter where you are this morning, these words can cause faith to rise up in your heart. And then we're going to pray together in Jesus' name. So come on, team. Why don't you lead us in that song? Because you are my champion. Giants fall when you sin undefeated. Every battle you've won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I'm seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who is called. Cause you are my champion And giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you want I am who you say I am You crown me with confidence I'm seated in the heavenly
is to keep our eyes fixed upon you. I pray, Father, for every man, every woman, every young person, Lord, under the sound of my voice, you know our circumstances. I thank you this morning. Right now, faith has shifted. Right now, atmospheres have shifted in our own heart, in our own mind. We take authority over doubt. We take authority over the lies of the enemy. And God, we choose, we make that decision to say we are confident of this. We are confident of this, that we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living, Father. That's our confession this morning. We will see the goodness of God. Father, I pray it over areas of lack. I pray for your provision. I pray, Father, wherever there is sickness, that we shall see your healing. I pray wherever there is confusion and pain, that God, we will see your direction your peace, your joy, your hope in Jesus' name. We will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Just very quickly this morning, when every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're in this place or you're watching online this morning, you've never made a commitment of your life to Jesus. You've never said, ah, I don't want to just believe there is a God. I want to know that God. Well, I want good news for you. Good news this morning. And it's the same news that Paul said to the jailer. Just believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You don't have to fix yourself. You don't have to become better than what you are. You just have to say, God, I need you. And God, I want Jesus. I want Jesus into my life. Jesus is the one who's made the way. Jesus is the one who paid the price. Jesus is the one who hung on the cross, died for your sin, for my sin. But he didn't just die. He rose again because he's got new life. And that new life is one decision away. That decision to say, God, I'm repenting. I'm turning. I don't want to do life my way anymore. I need you. I want you as my Lord and my Savior. If that's where you are this morning, either here in the building or online, I want you to pray this very simple prayer with me. We're all going to pray it together, but make this your prayer in Jesus' name. Let's say together, thank you, my heavenly Father, that you love me so much, that you sent Jesus Christ to die on that cross, but that he rose again, that I can have new life. God, today, I'm making my decision. I open up my heart. I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life. Today, I choose Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Fill my heart with your love and your grace and with the power of your Holy Spirit. Because from this day on, I choose to live as a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen, and amen, and amen, and amen. Hey, if you made that decision online, I'm sure there's something there on the screen, something you can do to let the church know you've made that decision. All they want to do is encourage you and help you know what the next steps are in that decision. If you're here in the building, don't you leave without letting someone know, hey, I gave my life to Christ when the pastor prayed, and uh, they'll want to help you as well. They'll never force you to do it, but they just want to help you know what the next thing is, just getting so close to the God who is good, Thank God for his word this morning. He's a good God. Pray you'll be blessed.